Good morning to all. Participant, participant, can you please mute your mic and video? We'll start the session now. Good morning to all. It's good or bad? COVID-19 pandemic it helps to gather all the researchers like-minded in a single platform today. First international webinar on smart nanomaterials 2020. I, on behalf of the Department of Physics, I'm happy to welcome you all, the professors, researchers, and students to this event. Today we have two sessions of talk. First by Professor Dr. D. Nandraj, Department of Physics, Bala University Coimbatore, on the topic of quantum dots and its application from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. After that, the next session is by Dr. Suresh, research professor, Georgia Institute of Technology, France, on the topic of three nitrites and its LED applications from 12 noon to 1 p.m. The first resource person, Dr. Dina Raj, professor, Department of Physics, Bale University. 
He finished his PhD in 2001 at Parle University. After his PhD, he received STA Research Fellow and COE Research Fellow in Japan for the past four, five years. He started his journey as Assistant Professor from, from 2006 in the He possesses sponsored research projects worth of ongoing 4.6 crores and completed 1.3 crores. He has successfully guided PhD of 8 PhDs completed and 8 is ongoing. Emily successfully completed 20 and 7 completed. In publication part, international journals, 15, journals, 15 nature journals with a total citation of 1730 and he is the principal in the many projects, international projects also. BDRFS, UGC, CPER scheme, and so on. Moreover, I am associated with Professor from 2007 onwards to till date. He is a humble and good human being from start to till date. He is the same. I am happy to invite Mysar to present in this session. Uh, sir, you can present your slide. Dr. Vijay Bharati. Hello. Can you able to hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Can I continue? So, sir, yes, just, just a second, sir. Just a okay. Second. Uh, Dr. Uma, ma'am, can you please mute your mic? Dr. Uma, ma'am, can you mute your mic, please? Uma Nearly. Okay. Ah, sure. Thank you. Uh, sir, you can present your slide. Yeah. So, it's... Uh, a good day for me. So, um, thank you for introducing me, Dr. Vijay Bardi, uh, in this uh, special day. Uh, good morning, one and all, um, professors, students, scholars. So, today I'm going to talk about uh, quantum dots and its applications. Uh, uh, in particular, I'm going to share the research experience of uh, myself and my students with you. Uh, hope you can uh, able to understand something about what Bharatiya University. So, uh, before going to start about the applications of quantum dots, let me introduce uh, the, the concept of quantum dots. So, the concept of quantum dots uh, is because of the dimensionality. Uh, when you reduce the materials uh, to the small dimension, uh, new I mean, uh, properties are coming. So one has to understand clearly what are those properties so that you can explore the quantum dots at the nanoscale level and use them for different applications. So one thing I would like to uh, tell, and before that, let me explain about this slide. So these are the structure. So first, let me explain about the uh, concepts about quantum dots and some devices uh, like quantum, uh, solar cells and uh, what is the limitation of existing solar cell and how one can able to overcome the existing uh, limitation associated with the silicon solar cells 
using quantum dot solar cells and uh, some photophysics of the quantum dot cell and uh, also i would like to talk about uh, single electron memory device um, a device which we fabricated and uh, we tested okay so you all know that uh, this you can able to see very clearly uh, schrodinger wave equation and it's a uh, a potential in a, uh, energy diagram and you can see uh, they are distributed uh, in probability to find the particles they are distributed like this okay so you can see uh, this confinement is not so uh, perfect so that uh, we are able to still have a probability to see the electron wave function out of the box so so why i'm talking about this slide means uh, uh, quantum dots are, of course, uh, small nanoparticles, I mean, uh, um, semiconductor quantum nanoparticles. Once you, if you keep the electrons inside it, uh, they are uh, expected to confine in the quantum dot. But sometimes uh, uh, perfect confinement is not possible in the quantum dot too. So in this lecture, we will explore all the reasons uh, why and what and how one can take this quantum dot to different application and so on. Before we start, I would like to uh, explain something. After Big Bang uh, theory, I mean, uh, Big Bang theory says that everything is coming from a single uh, point after a big explosion. Uh, I mean, fundamental particles like electrons. Uh, and these fundamental particles uh, join them together uh, into atoms, molecules, uh, and uh, material material materials, and so on. Uh, my question is that. Uh, suppose if you bring closer enough for two, I mean, uh, a negative electron and positively charged proton, what will happen? Well, whether they will touch each other? No, they will not touch each other. But we we always say that they are attracting towards each other. But actually, what is happening now? Uh, they are not touching each other. So this is because uh, energy levels are introduced around the positively charged proton and the electrons are in the energy levels, those energy levels. Those energy levels are not simply energy levels, they are quantum mechanical energy levels. Hence they obey quantum rules. So as long as the electrons in there, they need not fill into the nucleus. Otherwise what will happen? The electron has to attracted by the positively charged proton and fill into the nucleus if there are no energy levels. Imagine what will happen? Nothing will be there. If there are no energy level so the nature loves the quantum rules it, when our existence entire existence is due to the quantum rules okay when these atoms and molecules or the atoms and molecules like uh, state the energy levels are discrete in nature but once uh, these uh, uh, atoms and electron I mean uh, uh, molecules are uh, joining together into bulk material map until what happens the outermost levels overlap and bands are formed so we will get a different uh, material system with the different properties so i'm going to talk about all these uh, basics uh, of course because students will be there and uh, also we'll talk about some applications generally uh, one can uh, prepare nanomaterials by two different approaches um, these approaches are well known one is top-down approach, the other one is bottom-up approach. In the case of top-down approach, bulk material will be sliced into smaller uh, sized particle by means of some uh, applying energy. And therefore, you can able to get uh, nanoscale dimension particles as shown in this diagram. You can also get uh, graphene quantum dots from graphene, well, graphene or graphite and so on. Other way is you can allow the molecules to interact among themselves and control the growth and therefore you can able to get some uh, nanoparticles including quantum nanoparticles. You can also get graphene quantum dots by bottom-up approach method. Depending upon the preparation method, one can able to use these quantum nanoparticles in different uh, applications. Normally, if you think about the collateral quantum dots, for example, they are obtained using simple chemistry method. 
you can able to see different colors. It is because of the quantum confinement of it and the change in the size of the nanoparticles. Using these quantum nanoparticles, you can have a different device structures as shown in this figure. You can either construct transistors, uh, solar cells, or photoresistors, or LEDs, and so on. Why we are in need of all these structures means, uh, unlike bulk material system, quantum dot have well discrete energy levels, and therefore you can play with the electrons and therefore you can able to have control on the emission property, even the dynamics of the charges in the device and so on. Sometimes we can also able to um, develop some devices by means of uh, um, developing, I mean, preparing quantum dots using a, a bottom-up bottom -up method. Uh, involving uh, some sophisticated techniques. Previously, we have seen uh, collateral quantum dot root. In the case of collateral quantum dot root, uh, you can use simple chemicals, simple methods like hydrothermal method or uh, some, uh, if you take uh, zinc sulfide quantum dot, uh, a beaker is sufficient. You can take the precursors for zinc and uh, sulfur and uh, give some tea, uh, heat treatment so that uh, zinc, quantum, zinc, zinc sulfide quantum dot can be made. Sometimes uh, you need uh, some sophisticated growth methods uh, like uh, MOCVD, metal organic chemical vapor deposition, or uh, MOVP, metal organic uh, other um, vapor phase deposition methods, and so on. See, in this one of the diagrams, uh, a quantum dot layer is introduced between uh, uh, I mean, uh, layered material structure and the corresponding potential energy diagram is shown in here. You can able to see the quantum dot energy levels are well confined in this device structure. And therefore, you can have a control on the electron dynamics. Suppose if you are exciting this material system with a photon of particular energy, so that you can remove the electrons from a particular energy level to out of the box and so on. So these are all possible. Okay. One of the best way of producing quantum dot method is uh, Stansky cross snow growth model. I mean, growth. You will be having a, a single crystalline substrate onto which you can uh, able to grow some uh, single crystalline type uh, quantum dots. For example, let me explain. If you have a gallimosinate substrate, with the zero, zero, 001 direction, you can able to grow very beautifully indium arsenide quantum dots. The vapors for the indium and the arsenic will be supplied into the reactor chamber. These indium and uh, arsenic will uh, react on the substrate of the gallium arsenide. And uh, first it will form a, a thin layer of material. It will be monolayer, okay, on the order of uh, three angstrom unit. This layer will be also known as wetting layer. On to this, after the formation of wetting layer, you will be getting some island formation. These islands will be of the order of few nanometers, two to three nanometers. These islands are nothing but quantum dots. Why these islands are formed when you grow in demonstrate on this method means the strain between the gallium arsenide and indium arsenide. The lattice parameters of the gallium arsenide and indium arsenide are differing and therefore a strain will be introduced. So a continuous two-dimensional film is not possible to grow on this substrate. A thin layer of, of the order of three nanometer thickness is possible. Strain can withstand. After that, the strain is playing a dominant role and therefore some islands will be introduced. These islands are nothing but quantum dots. I will show you some beautiful images, uh, which we, I mean, uh, my colleagues has developed in uh, uh, sophisticated uh, laboratory condition. So before going to uh, talk about the uh, quantum nanoparticles, it is always important to talk about the materials and their classifications, because uh, you must know um, the basics too, always. 
in generally we can classify the materials into three types uh, depending upon the band gap for example here i have shown three different types of material system the one is a um, conductor you have balance band and a conduction band there there is no energy gap if there is no energy gap we call them as metals if the energy gap is very small between the balance band and the conduction band you call them as semiconductors the band gap is wider then it is known as insulator so mostly i'm going to talk about the semiconductor and semiconductor based nanoparticles and quantum knots if i wanted to talk about the semiconductor means you must also know the famous semiconductors uh, uh, beautiful concept it is a silicon you can able to see if you wanted to get some kind of uh, conductivity from the silicon means uh, you have to introduce some doping if you don't dope anything silicon will be highly resistive so in order to get some free electrons this silicon is always doped with arsenic atom arsenic atom is a pentavalent element in element so will it will be having five electrons in the outermost cells whereas silicon is having four electrons when you introduce these arsenic atoms into the silicon network it replaces the silicon network when silicon atom in the silicon network and therefore one additional electron is introduced thereby by means of uh, introducing so many numbers of um, arsenic atoms you can produce uh, as many electrons as you want that is possible so because of the introduction of electrons the chemical potential changes which is not shown in this diagram the blue dotted line which is closely uh, mean associated with the conduction band similarly if you have a silicon you can dope with uh, boron boron is a trivalent element when boron is replacing silicon in the silicon matrix so that a hole will be introduced hole is nothing but a missing of electron remember you need a space for the movement of electron suppose if you are having extra electron that electron will move around the crystal so thereby you can able to get conductivity similarly when you introduce holes the holes is a some missing of electrons so the missing means a vacancy will be there through this vacancy the electrons from the silicon can able to move around and therefore you can be able to get the conductivity so the purpose is the purpose of doping is to the purpose of doping is to uh, get some conductivity and if you dope the material with the boron you will get a, a fermi level and that is very close to the balance band level like it is shown in this figure okay now i'm going to explain the limitations of the solar energy conversion process using the silicon material system so normally uh, normally you have a pn junction can i continue uh, some noise is coming okay so uh, you have a pn I mean uh, structure which is going to be uh, used for us to get um, uh, solar energy okay so this is the pn junctions uh, uh potential energy level diagram you can able to see and this is the p side and this is n side when you make a junction what happens no uh, the electrons from the n type is uh, going into the p type semiconductor material and the holes are moving into the n type semiconductor material and therefore a, an equilibrium is established if you want to have an equilibrium then what happens the bands are bended like this as shown in this diagram remember you are making this pn junction using bulk silicon material when you make a junction using bulk material you will be having always a, a band of energy levels the balance band and the conduction band as shown in this figure so 
when this pn junction is exposed to solar light electron hole pair will be produced let me assume that exactly 1.1 electron volt of energy is falling on this material and therefore a hole is introduced leaving an electron in the conduction band this electron and the hole will will be driven by the potential created in the junction and therefore they are separated once they are separated you can take them out of the material as a current if there is no potential I mean this is a um, potential which drift the which help to drift the electron from the junction if there is no such a potential then the electron and the hole will recombine so you won't get any in photo current so you always need a junction to get a photo current the point is this kind of material can be used to convert only certain frequencies of energy but in the solar spectrum you have a wide range of frequencies you cannot able to use all those frequencies that is the biggest issue we all know that the conversion efficiency of the pn junction solar cell best solar cell let it be uh, crystalline type solar cell it will be of the order of 25 percentage why one is unable to improve the efficiency of the solar cell means you have to understand some fundamental properties of the material system as i said before you are having a material system bulk material system with band of states suppose let us assume this uh, material system is exposed to uh, uv light photon so uv light photon will generate a hole in the deep of the valence band and an electron in the top of the conduction band because the density of states in this region the conduction band is very high similarly the whole I mean, valence band is also very high the lifetime of this electron and hole will be very very shorter you cannot be able to collect these electrons directly from here to the electrode similarly you cannot collect the holes from a valence band directly from a deep of the semiconductor to outside it is not possible at all because the lifetime of the charge carrier is very small they are always try to come down to the lower energy state by means of emitting the extra energy as heat so this process we call it as cooling process the electron is said to be having higher energy it is now coming to the lower energy by means of a process known as cooling process you can also call this process as thermalization process thermalization it means it gives out energy to the crystal lattice of the silicon so if you touch the crystal and uh, silicon material it will be hot because of this thermalization process the point i wanted to stress is that the work done by the uv light is wasted as heat so it means that you cannot able to convert the higher energy frequencies of the solar energy spectrum into useful energy that is the point i want to stress and therefore the efficiency of the devices cannot be improved at all so if you wanted to improve the efficiency of this slide I mean device means you need to able to collect the electrons before cooling one can able to collect the electrons before cooling if the electrons and holes is available in the higher energy state for longer time and how to make sure that these electrons and holes are in the higher energy state for longer time means it is possible you have to reduce the density of states you know the uncertainty principle between the energy and time so you can apply that and you can able to see if the density is decreased actually the lifetime of the carriers will be increased so if you wanted to reduce the density of states of the material means uh, you cannot do any magic simply you have to do size reduction when you reduce size reduction what happens to no, the number of atoms which are contributing its outermost like um, in orbits or orbitals to make the hybridization process is decreased and therefore naturally the density of states is decreased so 
when you reduce the size of the material, a semiconductor material in particular, to a nano level means the energy level densities are decreasing, decreasing, and the stage is coming there, you can able to see well discretized energy levels. Almost atom-like properties now given to the material system. Because of that, it is expected that the lifetime of the electrons in the higher energy state will be much larger. But in practice, there are some drawbacks are coming into picture. And one has to really understand and address the problem so that the efficiency of the device can be improved. Well, <clears throat> previously I have uh, discussed about the quantum con I mean, uh, quantum dot uh, formation. Now, we all know that you have uh, quantum dots, okay, and you have excitons. For the newers, I wanted to tell what is an exciton. Suppose if you have a material, and if you are exciting this material with uh, a photon, electron hole pair is produced electron and hole pair these electron and hole pair are binded together with the energy binding energy and therefore they will move inside the material collectively this exciton is known as a quasi particle the, if you want to uh, get a uh, solar energy means you have to separate this uh, uh, electron and hole pair from this binding and for that only that the potential barrier is used which is formed in the pn junction there are three types of uh, excitons naturally one is vanier mode type exciton which is generated in semiconductor materials the other type of excitons are frankel exciton and another one is charge transfer exciton if you look at these three diagrams you can able to see the case of Frankel exciton, the exciton bore radius is very smaller. The reason is that it is a, a poor dielectric material medium, and therefore it is a poor dielectric material medium, and it is made up of uh, uh, molecular crystals. Okay, it is a molecular crystal made up of molecules because molecules are held together by weak interactions like hydrogen bond and weak electrostatic forces. The dielectric uh, strength of this material medium is very lesser, and therefore, uh, there is no additional force is acting on this uh, electron hole pair, and therefore, they are confined very strongly. You have one more uh, exciton, charge transfer exciton. Here, also, you can able to I mean uh, electron hole pair is there, but uh, this is also made up of molecular crystals, but uh, heterotype molecular crystals. You have two different types of molecules by which this material medium is formed. So when you exit, exit the system with photons, electron will be introduced in one molecule and hole will be introduced in another molecule. So because of that, you call them as charge transfer type exciton. In the case of semiconductors, the semiconductors are held together by strong covalent force. And therefore, the dielectric constant of this material is very stronger. This dielectric strength helps to separate this as formed electrons and holes is out of wide range and therefore the exciton bore radius is always higher in the case of semiconductor materials. Okay. The question is that can you able to increase the exciton binding energy of the semiconductor material? Yes. How to improve the exciton binding energy of this? excitons, you have to reduce the dimension of the materials. When you reduce the dimension of the materials, you are forcefully confining the electron and holes into the dimension of the material. It means there is no space for the, the remember, it is a, the size of the exciton board radius. If the quantum dot size is uh, less than this exciton board radius, it means uh, we are forcefully confining this electron and holes into a smaller space and therefore they are forcefully confined and because of the closeness of the electron and holes they are held together by strong force so if you decrease the size still further the electron and holes will be held together with a much stronger force 
and this is reflected in the change in the band gap. We all know that when you reduce the size of the semiconductor quantum nanoparticles into smaller, smaller, and so on, the band gap is increasing, increasing, increasing. So you can able to see the schematic diagram. When the size is decreasing to this side, the quantum dot is uh, started to emit a blue light. Well, I told you, no, I'm going to explain you about uh, some uh, the applications of quantum dot. You all know well about the quantum confinement effect, how one can able to produce quantum dots. Now, I'm going to discuss about one of the very important applications of the quantum dot. How to fabricate a single electron memory device. The logic behind the memory device is very simple. We all know that a memory device means you need to represent two states because we are using um, uh, digits, zeros and ones to represent any data. Uh, let it be numerical number or alphabet. You can be represent all these data in zeros and ones. It means you can uh, store all this uh, information in zeros and ones, a combination of zeros and ones. So if you wanted to have a memory device, means you need to have two states to represent these zeros and ones. That is the logic behind it. Here, the logic is that we are going to represent few electrons or single electrons as zeros and ones. Imagine that when you are able to represent the single electrons as zeros and ones, then how many data you can able to store? Infinite number of data you can store in a small space. So I'm going to discuss about the logic behind this single electron storage in these slides. The logic is very simple. I'm going to have a quantum dot. In the quantum dot, I'm going to place some electrons. Having an electron in the quantum dot, I'm going to sense it with a quantum nano wire. It means I'll be having two systems. One is quantum dot system. The other one is quantum wire system. After having an electron in the quantum dot, using the quantum wire's conduction property, I'm going to sense the presence of quantum dot or not. How? By means of closely placing them. Here, uh, schematic diagrams are shown in figure. Okay, This is a um, transistor-like structure. So you have a, a source drain and a channel. And to the top of the channel, you will be having uh, electrons. Uh, it's a bulk uh, transistor. So it is a bulk memory structure. You can convert this into a single electron memory device structure. So you'll be having a, again, source drain contact, but you'll be having a single electron or a quantum dot, which is having a capacity to store only single or two or some few numbers of electron will be placed on the top of. So by means of having the electrons in the quantum dot, we must be able to sense the presence of electrons. You cannot sense this uh, single electron using a bulk bulk uh, wire. Bulk in the bulk wire, if you take uh, millions and billions of electrons, will be there because of the presence of one or two electrons in the quantum dot. The change in the electrical conductivity of the bulk wire cannot be. Uh, useful. So you cannot see any change in the conductivity at all. So suppose if you wanted to sense this uh, very sensitive presence of one electron or two, two electron in the quantum dot means you need to have a quantum, no, uh, quantum wire. The quantum wire means uh, it is again a nanostructure which will be having a confined layer of electrons. Few numbers of electrons will be there and therefore the presence of um, electrons in the quantum dot can be sensed very easily. Okay, so that is the logic. It means uh, if I, I'm going to measure the current through the quantum wire, 
If the current through the quantum wire is high in magnitude, means there is no electrons in the quantum dot. Suppose if there is an electron in the quantum dot, means the electrons in the quantum dot will electrostatically repel the charge transport in the quantum nanowire, and therefore the resistance of the resistance for the flow of current will be increased in the quantum nanowire. And therefore, what happens now? A decrease in magnitude of current will be flowing through the device structure, and it is represented in this diagram. You can able to say it is a IV characteristics, a simple IV characteristics of the device structure. In the x-axis, you are having gate voltage, and in the y-axis, you are having drain current. You can see when you sweep sweep in the positive direction, you get a high magnitude current A to B. In blue line, it is shown in figure, and it is represented as one in diagram. At a particular gate voltage, what happens? Some of the electrons are introduced in the quantum dot. Where from these electrons are coming means the electrons are coming from nothing. They are coming from the quantum nanowire. Why the quantum nanowire is able to supply the electrons to the uh, quantum dot means. You are changing the gate potential, and because of the change in the gate potential, the quantum dot energy levels are brought below the Fermi Fermi level of the particle device device structure, and it is represented in this figure. And because of that, what happened? The electron from the one-dimensional quantum wire is transferred into the quantum dot nanostructure, and because this quantum dot Got not nano structure is very closer to the nano wire. The electron present in the quantum dot will create a repulsive field in the quantum nano wire, and therefore the resistance for the flow of electron will be increased. And therefore, when you reverse the sweep, a low current will be passing through. So this is a hysteresis slope. This is on current state, and this is off current state. Remember, this on and off uh, current states are uh, I mean due to uh, only few electrons, and it is a logic. Generally, you can able to uh, confine the electrons. See, I I told you no bulk uh, material uh, wire is not possible to sense the presence of electrons in the quantum dot. You need to have a thin layer of quantum dot. I mean uh, electrons. How to get a thin layer? Normally, one can able to get thin layer in MOSFETs, and uh, you all know that. Uh, uh, suppose if you are having, for example, um, p-type substrate-based MOSFET, by means of applying a strong positive voltage to the gate electrode, you can invert the type of conductivity at the um, Type of conductivity of the MOSFET uh, into n type, and therefore a thin layer can be generated as shown in this figure. So we call this as a inversion layer, and this inversion layer is confined. This is two dimensional in nature. The other way is you can have a, a heterostructure type uh, device. You can take uh, two different materials with the two different work functions. For example, in this case, uh, aluminium gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide are sandwiched, and therefore, we are able to uh, get a structure as shown in this figure. This is the valence band edge of the quantum dot, and this is the conductance band edge of the gallium arsenide. I mean, quantum dot, and. Uh, This is the conduction band edge of the aluminium gallium arsenide and valence band edge of the aluminium arsenide. By having aluminium arsenide, aluminium gallium arsenide, and either side of the gallium arsenide, you can able to get a structure as shown in this figure. If you look at this structure very carefully, you can see it looks like a uh, particle in a box type structure. Yes, exactly. Particle in a structure type structure I mean structures are we are studying theoretically in quantum physics subject, but here one can able to produce these structures 
by means of uh, fabricating materials layer by layer okay if you look at this box it is a barrier once if you have electrons in this uh, uh, energy levels they are confined they cannot go out of the box we need to apply some thermal energy or some photons so that these electrons can go out otherwise these electrons will be there okay in my uh, experiment i used uh, mocvd type uh, growth method and i fabricated uh, the device layers as follows shit which, which is 001 in nature onto which some um, masking patterns are developed and uh, using electron beam lithography and photo lithography we have opened a narrow channel the channel width is about 600 nanometer this 600 nanometer channel onto which i am going to develop all these layers it's a gallium austenite buffer gallium austenite aluminum gallium austenite and so on by having all these layers I was able to produce a one dimensional electron confinement in the structure after having a one dimensional electron confinement in the structure and on the top of this we have grown indium austenite by same mocvd method it is thereby it was possible to have a quantum wire and part together after having this structure is shown in this figure semi gate it fabricated gate electrode the dimension of the device is nano scale okay after having this we have fabricated gate electrode onto the top and by means of uh, uh, measuring the source to drain current as function of gate voltage we are able to see the hysteresis behavior of the device structure a very beautiful hysteresis behavior remember the quantum dots involved in this device structures are very few and therefore uh, we got only I mean uh, and quantum nano wire and this structure is also very narrow in dimension therefore we got uh, the current values in uh, microamperes as well as on in this figure and we have measured this uh, um, high wick curve at 20 kelvin suppose if you are increasing the temperature operating temperature of the device then what happens the hysteresis behavior is disappearing why the hysteresis behavior is disappearing means the electron confinement is not possible at this temperature the reason is very simple we have used gallium austenite and demosnite type structure and therefore uh, the conduction band offset uh, which is going to help us to confine the electrons in the uh, gallium austenite is very small in nature when you raise the temperature using the thermal energy available in the atmosphere the electrons in the quantum dot can come out of the material system and therefore it is not possible to have memory operation but once if you perform this measurements at very low temperature then memory operation is possible and one can able to see a beautiful change in the uh i mean uh, difference in voltage initially it is uh, about 0.15 voltage and it is decreasing decreasing as temperature is increasing at uh, 20 or uh, 200 kelvin it is disappearing completely so these factors are telling you very important uh, um, things confinement means uh, uh, not room temperature confinement it is at low temperature confinement suppose if you are having a memory device means it will work at only 20 kelvin temperature if you wanted to have a single electron or few, few electron memory device which can work at room temperature means you have to prepare a material system with a um, high 
band offsets. The band offset I want to tell, which is nothing but conduction band offset. It is in, it is the conduction band edge of the uh, gallium mosaide, and it is a conduction band edge of aluminium gallium mosaide. And the difference between these two energy levels is known as conduction band offset. It will be very minimal. Okay. In uh, my laboratory, so sorry, I, this work was done at uh, Hokkaido University during my postdoctoral position. Uh, the device which was uh, fabricated by, by me, some of my colleagues were trying to have a very small quantum dot on the top of the quantum nano wires. You can able to see by MOCVD method, you can able to see very beautiful quantum dots on the top of the um, quantum nano wire. Either they can able to have a quantum dot like this or like this. By means of optimizing the growth condition, they were able to obtain these structures. If you can use these uh, structures for the memory operations, means uh, you can able to have control on the uh, electron numbers precisely. So that is also possible. But for that, one has to work very precisely, accurately with your dedicated times. In this uh, diagram, I'm showing some of the logic circuit at nanoscale level. Uh, my colleagues are uh, fabricating this device using a, a uh, metal organic uh, vapor phase heptaxel method. You can able to see this is a single nano wire and this is another single nano wire. Okay. It means in this nano wire, electron layer is confined because of the heterostructure. By means of having suitable gate electrodes, they, they can create transistors. In this diagram, they have created four transistors. I mean, uh, and they, were, they joined them together for logic application, logic uh, operation. So uh, my point is that uh, if you use the potential way of fabricating the materials we can able to have single electron device like applications like single electron memory device single electron transistors and so on this is what i wanted to tell okay well i also subjected the samples for the uh, real time measurements what is real time measurements means uh, after having the electrons in the quantum dot i wanted to see how long it will be there in the quantum dot as a function of time. Interestingly, even after 400 seconds, I got a low magnitude current in the quantum nano wire. And this low magnitude current is because the presence of electrons in the quantum dot, which ripples the, when it, it creates the resistance or resistivity in the material system and therefore low current is passing. But once if you raise the temperature to 200K, the electrons in the quantum dot are escaping very easily. And therefore, after some 20 or 40 seconds, uh, the current is maximized as soon as the figure. Remember, what is the connection between the temperature, atmospheric temperature and uh, electron volts? In materials, uh, you have band gaps and electron band gaps, you are representing them in terms of electron volt. What is the connection between temperature and uh, electron volts? It is represented here. One degree Kelvin can be equal to 0 0.06, 0 0.068 uh, an electron volt. In the case of 200 degree Kelvin, 24 milli electron volt. Sorry, 17.24 milli electron volt. But the offset, the conduction band offset will be very minimal in the case of uh, gallium mosaide, indium mosaide coupled structures. And therefore, the electrons are not able to confine in the temperature. And therefore, memory operation is not possible at 200 Kelvin. Well, one more thing, very important thing I would like to talk We have also fabricated a uh, device structure 
in the table structure we were able to see a hysteresis slope with a large voltage difference as shown in this figure and moreover the iv curve is not so smooth we can able to see some ups and come ups and downs as shown in this figure and it is because of the coulomb blockade effect let me explain what is coulomb blockade effect suppose uh, if you have a memory device structure you have a one dimensional electron confined layer and the top of this you have a quantum dots and you have discrete energy levels in the discrete energy levels you can able to place some electrons these electrons will only develop a repulsive force and therefore a change in the resistance can be measured as a memory operation now suppose if you are having many more numbers of quantum dot on the quantum wire what will happen many more many more number of charges will be trapped in the quantum dot and the four what happens no they repel the electrons in the one dimensional channel randomly and therefore the uniformity of the electron distribution is perturbed largely you can able to see by comparing these two diagrams the first diagram the channel is shown in this figure in a green color which is uniform the channel is nothing but electron distribution it is uniform but whereas in this case the channel is non uniform because it is on the top having large number of quantum dots in the quantum dots you are having more number of electrons and because of that the repulsive forces between these two electron system is in such a way so that the electrons in the channel is distributed non uniformly remember you are having now islands of electrons the island dimensions will be of the order of 5 nanometer to 10 nanometer and because of this see uh, on the you are not uh, changing the dimension of the material system you are changing the dimension of the electron confined region and therefore you are able to see few island I mean a few nanometer sized islands of electron clouds and because of the few nanometer sized electron cloud you will be having again discrete energy levels the discrete energy levels the electrons will be distributed between these two islands what you are having you can able to remember if you are having a capacitor you will be having two electrodes the electrodes will be having electrons and positively charged particles and at the center you will be having a dielectric material medium it means a capacitance is found by means of having a dielectric medium particle medium at the center and electrodes on either side a similar situation is taking place here also you have electron rich region an island another island and in between them you are having no electron region and therefore they look like a, a capacitance or capacitor if you want to make this electron move from one island to other line or other island means it has to overcome a barrier a potential barrier and you call them as a coulomb blockade barrier the electron can able to come out of this material I mean first island to the second island by means of two ways either by means of uh, increasing the temperature you can give the energy to the electron in the island first island to jump the barrier and therefore it can go to the second island third, third island and so on and therefore a current is possible otherwise what you have to do means you have to shift the energy levels with respect to each other by means of changing the applied potential energy gate potential energy for example and by means of my by means of uh, applying the gate potential you can uh, change the energy levels of the respect to that of the other island and therefore uh, the electron can move from one island to uh, another island and it is represented here it is a source and it is a drain and it is the island and uh, you are having a barrier like this in the island you are having e 
n plus one one energy level, which is slightly above the Fermi level of the source, and therefore you cannot supply the electron from the source to the drain because it is blocked. By means of applying gate potential, you can bring down this energy level of the quantum dot down, and therefore what happens? The energy level uh, e n plus one energy level is brought below the Fermi energy level of the source and therefore the electron from the source is uh, tunneling through the barrier and goes to the E n plus 1 state of the electron island and from here again they go to the drain through tunneling process. If such a process is taking place means uh, we call them as a single electron process because remember by means of applying gate electrodes, you are bringing down the electron energy levels precisely and therefore uh, you can able to have the number of electrons which can able to transfer from the source to drain. So this Coulomb electrode, I mean blocked effect can be used to um, fabricate single electron memory device as well. So we have make we made in a uh, memory device, and because of the non-uniformity of the electron distribution and the involvement of more number of electrons stored in the quantum dot, we are able to get some kind of ups and downs in the um, IV characteristics. And moreover, because there is a non-uniformity in the electron distribution of the quantum nanowire. The magnitude of the current is also very low in uh, value as shown in this figure. So the point is that if you are able to develop some devices using epitaxial methods means then and the science and the device types everything is uh, differing. So that is the point I wanted to stress. Okay, and uh, now uh, one more example I would like to give. Uh, moderator, can you help me? How long I can take? Hello? Sir, uh, you can take another five or ten minutes, sir. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so far, we have discussed about the quantum dots applications uh, uh, when you make quantum dots using epitaxial methods. Okay. Sometimes you can make quantum dots using simple use them for some uh, device applications. So here, I'm going to share some of my experience of uh, fabricating um, a solar cell device uh, which can uh, involve hot electrons. Let me explain about hot electrons. I told you initially, when you make a quantum dot, you have discrete energy levels as shown in this figure. Because of the discrete energy levels, when you keep the electrons in the higher energy state, the lifetime will be very shorter. It is expected. When the electron lifetime is very short, the chances of extracting these electrons out of this material system is increasing. But not possible at all because the quantum dots are very small in size and therefore on the surface they will be having lots of uh, positive and negative charges. These electrons will preferably go to the positive and negative charges and these have been trapped states and from the trapped states they will relax down to the bandage states. And because of this relaxation method one is hard to remove the electrons from the quantum dots as hot electrons. That is one thing. The second thing is that we are not going to use only one or few quantum dots to fabricate device. There will be more number of quantum dots. If an electron is or electron hole pair is generated in a single quantum dot means they have to other quantum dot and other quantum dot till they reaches to the electrode surface. Before going to the electrode, 
the chances for the trapping of all these charges will be more. Suppose if you want to make sure that these electrons are not trapping the surface means you should make sure that the surface states are not there. How to make sure that surface states are not there? Because the quantum dots are very small so definitely you will be having large number of um, how to make sure there is no trap states. Trap states will be there but you, can, you have to electric forces of attraction and repulsion by means of opposite charges and therefore the effect of the trap states which are distributed on the quantum dot on the electrons photo generated electron on hold can be reduced it means that we have to fabricate I mean we have to uh, passivate the quantum dot surfaces in one of our studies uh, we have prepared cadmium telluride quantum dots, a quantum dot, beautiful quantum dot, which is shown in this figure. It means that high resolution uh, transmission electron microscopy is shown in this figure. You can see. After having this quantum dot, I wanted to passivate this uh, surface states using some molecules. So for that, uh, we have chosen beta coretin as a molecular system. Beta coretin is a very beautiful molecule which is having a linear trans conjugated structure as shown in this figure. Of course, it is a very small molecule. We have introduced this beta coretin into the cadmium telluride quantum dot precursor. After introducing the beta coretin, we found some interesting things. The first thing is that an enhancement in the emission was seen. If we don't introduce the beta coretin into the system, we got a very minimal emission as shown in this figure, red in color. Once I introduced the beta coretin into the system, then emission of the cadmium telluride quantum dot was improved drastically. You can able to see. So, what is happening when we introduce the beta coretin? Increment in the emission yield is only possible if the confinement is perfect. To confirm the confinement, we have enlarged the tip of the emission band. We have seen the emission peak position is also shifting towards the higher energy side. So it means that the electron wave function associated with the excited photons in the cadmium telluride quantum dots are well well confined and that is because of the presence of the beta coretin molecule. So we wanted to understand what is the role of beta coretin. Before that, we wanted to test that the beta coretin is, is having some contact with the uh, quantum dot. So using FTR analysis, we confirmed the beta curtains interaction with the cadmium telluride quantum dot, and it is explained in this slide. We particularly monitored the bagging vibrational mode of the uh, CH uh, uh, molecular stretching, bagging vibrational mode of the CH bond of the beta curtain molecule. Remember, this cadmium telluride quantum dot is. Uh, already passivated with the olic acid molecule and because beta coretin is intercalating in between olic acid molecule and establishing an upright con confirmation the CH wagging vibrational mode is having some con constraint and therefore this mode is disappearing in the FTR spectrum and therefore the, by means of uh, observing this we are able to confirm this molecule is uh, having some kind of uh, interaction kind of upright confirmation means one of the end of the molecule is having in contact with the quantum dot surface not all the entire molecule and we have seen that the emission is increasing and the tip of the emission band is shifting towards the blue side and these are all the indication that beta coretin is having some kind of type 1 band structure the type 1 band structure is very simple this is the quantum dot energy levels and uh, 
molecular energy levels, HOMO and LUMO level. The quantum knot energy level, particularly the valence and the conduction bands are well confined within the HOMO and LUMO levels of the molecular system and therefore uh, the system is known as type 1 band structure. You can able to see as we have seen before we are having a conduction band offset because the LUMO level of the beta carotene molecule is little further away with respect to the conduction bandage state of the cadmium chloride quantum dot. Because of there is an increment in the emission yield. To make sure that this is having time, we have tested this by means of subjecting the samples to energy dependent emission behavior. It means that slowly I increased the excitation energy of the I mean uh, emission process and thereby monitor the emission uh, trend. Suppose if I use a photon which is having an energy difference between the valence and the conduction bandage state, then the electrons are promoted exactly from the valence bandage state to conduction bandage state. The electrons and holes are well confined. If I increase the energy of the excitation, the electron are shifted a little bit farther in the energy position. Thus, by means of slowly increasing the excitation energy, we were able to increase the electron energy level position slowly, slowly to a higher energy value. As long as the electrons are within the band offset, the electrons recombine with the holes and started emitting very strong emission. And because of the type 1 band confinement, the electron probability finding outside of this box, this box was very lesser and therefore um, there was a, I mean, a shift in the emission band position towards the blue side. This is the energy of the excitation beyond the confinement then what happened? The electrons disappear suddenly. It was surprising. Initially up to a particular excitation energy they were able to see a strong emission but once the change the excitation energy by means of few tens of nanometer, then the entire emission was gone. Why? It is very clear. Once I, if I exit the electrons about this level, means this LUMO level of the carotene molecule. And once they go to the LUMO level to recombine with the holes in the valence band of the cadmium telluride is very minimal and therefore radiative recombination is not possible and therefore the emission is decreased very drastically. Remember, I take some five minutes of time, um, okay, um, because these uh, electrons are going from the higher energy state to the LUMO level, we call them as hot electrons. You can, these hot electrons can be harvested further out of the material system for solar and uh, solar and energy uh, applications. So that is the idea of our uh, work, and we are planning to do something on it. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, you can see this is the emission spectrum. You can see once I, the excitation energy is changed beyond the value, uh, there is a sudden uh, quenching of emission is taking place. We have seen in this system. Well, then we were able to. Uh, I mean, we, we need to conduct some uh, experiments to confirm and the hot electrons presence in the beta carotene molecule because uh, we know that uh, the quenching is because of the transfer of electrons from the quantum dot to cadmium, I mean, beta carotene. And to that, to confirm that, we uh, recorded bleach spectra and uh, were able to um, confirm the presence of hot electrons in the beta carotene molecule as well. And uh, the bridge spectra at 450 nanometer is the evidence. Okay. Moderator, is it okay? Uh, uh, can I summarize and uh, conclude? Yes, sir, you can summarize. Okay, thank you. So, okay. So, uh, the logic is, uh, logic is very simple. Once, if you are going down to the um, nano dimensional world, means uh, uh, the materials property is changing and therefore uh, you can able to have 
uh, different devices, different uh, device structures, and so on. With the existing facilities, you can able to have um, a different uh, device structures, understand the material concepts, and so on. So, uh, with this, I will then finally go to the acknowledgement part. That is the more important. So, I would like to um, thank the organizers for giving me a uh, wonderful opportunity to meet the uh, learned community, uh, professors, uh, teachers, uh, students, scholars, and uh, so on. I thank you one and all. And uh, this is my final slide. Uh, I would like to thank uh, UGC for sponsoring a center with potential for uh, particular area research. Uh, this center was uh, sponsored in the year 2016 to us. Uh, they have sanctioned some 3.5 crores. And we have established a set of art facilities like femtosecond lasers um, to characterize the materials, uh, polar energy materials, uh, particularly electron dynamics at femtoscale lifetime. And I also would like to thank Rosa of Phase 1 and Phase 1 uh, uh, projects. Using them, I mean, using their I mean, uh, fund, uh, we purchased uh, transient absorption spectrometer and other facilities. And therefore, in our laboratory, we can able to measure transient absorption uh, uh, data from the quantum dots and other molecular systems. And I also thank DST Fast Track project. Uh, there was, uh, with that facility, we are able to install the time correlated single photon counting equipment, a solar simulator. Uh, IPCE equipment and so on. And also, I would like to thank um, uh, various fast track, I mean, uh, DST fast track project and various DRD projects. Uh, because of their support, we were able to establish a good number of facilities in the Department of Physics. So, uh, with all these facilities, we are conducting some research. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, you can please ask. Participants, you can text your questions in the chat box. We have a question. How the resistance of quantum wire varies with temperature? Uh, resistance of the quantum wire. Yes, sir. Varies with temperature. Yeah. So quantum wire, of once uh, if the material system is in nanoscale dimension energy levels, the discrete energy levels, electrons are confined, and uh, if you change the temperature, naturally the electrons will uh, transfer from one energy level to another energy level, and therefore. Uh, there is a chance for the change in the resistance as well. So there is any preliminary characterization technique is there to confirm quantum dot? Yeah, you can uh, see, uh, you can uh, first confirm, confirm the size by looking at the HRTM facility, number one. And the best way to confirm, I mean, confirm the quantum dot is having quantum confinement effect or not. You can just take a optical absorption spectra. So definitely it will show a blue shifted absorption band. And later you can take emission spectra. Sometimes emission spectra may not be giving some uh, uh, blue shifted emission spectrum because uh, if there are some defect levels, uh, there will be defect emission is possible. So absorption spectrum would be better. In addition to that, HRTM facility is okay. Next question is, other than arsenic compounds, can we have quantum dots? Yeah. yeah. So you can have indium austenite and gallium austenite based systems are um, well-known material system. Why people are using means uh, uh, because of uh, number of reasons. They are uh, direct band gap materials and very good type of electronic materials. And other than that, we can use uh, zinc uh, sulfide and so on, so many other quantum dots. And graphene quantum dot is also possible, yeah.
but you have to decide the which material uh, and which application and so on that is uh, depending upon your uh, interest any other questions from the participants um let's let's make this session uh, thank you sir uh, okay okay thank you thank you but thank you this is highly interesting and informative session on quantum dots okay uh, so informative sir thank you sir thank you okay sir. thank you can i then uh, thank you one and all so i can uh, leave now okay Yes. Okay. Thank you. Adieu, we give you two minutes of time as a break, and then we can start the so next session again in just in two seconds. मुंद हिड़क मुख
ಮಾಡಿ ಅಮ್ಮನ ಮಾಡಿದ್ ನಾನು ಮಾಡಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ರನ್ನ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಚೆನ್ನೈ 
on a global characterization of gallium nitride. After which, he moved to the International Joint Laboratory, Georgia Tech, CNRS, France, in 2010, to continue his research on metal organic vapor phase epitaxial growth of three nitrides and its nanostructure. Currently working on multiple funded projects and ensures timely delivery of milestones. He has actively contributed on three nitride growth for deep ultraviolet photonics, new generation solar cells, and UV source and sensors. His work in this area has generated more than 60 pre reviewed journal articles with nine 17 citations. He has attracted an enormous number of research groups around the world in the past few years, resulting in successful collaborations, funding of research projects, on delivering novel materials. Me and Dr. Suresh have been working for more than the past 18 years, and also as a good collaborator in our research. I invite Dr. Suresh to present his talk on three nitride growth and its LED applications. Suresh, the forum is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Bharati. Yeah, it's audible. Okay. Thank you. So, these are my slides. I hope you can see I have changed uh, the title of my presentation. So, I'm not going to talk about uh, three nitrides and light emitting diode applications, but I'm changing a little bit so that uh, it will be much more familiar for you. So I'm going to talk about three nitrides in general, which is considered as a future silicon material. So I, I think I don't have to introduce you to silicon because um, the previous introduced silicon, how the doping works and how we can form heterostructures and all this stuff. So I should thank my previous, previous speakers. Uh, can I can I go ahead? It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So I hope everything is okay. You can hear me. Okay. So. So. It's audible. Audible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, as uh, Professor Vijay Bharati said. I'm Dr. Suresh Sundaram. So I am from Georgia Tech line. So you can see uh, I have uh, I have a Georgia Tech logo on my presentation slide. So these are my team members. Um, so I work in a team of let's say 20 to 30 researchers working all together, fabricating uh, devices on what we grow. So I'm basically a grower who works on growing three nitride materials for lot of applications. It has a lot of applications, so we, we concentrate on all kind of applications that these materials have. So to name a few, it is it is a major material for blue LEDs, white LEDs, and we can convert whatever color we want by adjusting the heterostructure uh, and the composition of the heterostructure. Uh, so I'm basically from Georgia Tech Lorraine, so this picture you see uh, explains you where I am from. So I'm from France. Georgia Tech is basically in Atlanta. So we have a huge uh, system, university system in Georgia Tech in Atlanta. So I am from Georgia Tech Lorraine, which is an European campus, and it is a uni unique platform which has all three uh, education, research, and innovation as part of it. So for education, we have Georgia Tech Lorraine. For research, we have Georgia Tech CNRS. Uh, it's a combined platform. It's an international joint unit. Uh, and for innovation, we have created uh, Institute Lafayette in 2000 platform uh, for research and development of devices, device prototypes for future future applications. So I'm from I'm basically from France, but we have very close collaboration with Georgia Tech in Atlanta also because we are we are we are same same we are in the same platform so today i'm going to talk about um, a lot of topics so this is my outline 
So I'm going to start with our motivation and application to do research in three night rides. I'm going to talk about epitaxy in general, how we are going to do epitaxy. So here again, I have to say uh, thanks to the previous speaker. He was he was covering a lot of uh, epitaxy or let's say emotivity growth of gallium arsenide structures uh, uh, during his, his research tenure. Uh, now I'm going to speak about a little bit more from, from where he left off. I'm going to talk about epitaxy, nanoheteroepitaxy, which is a little bit uh, a little bit far more advanced than epitaxy. And then I'm going to talk about a very new topic, which is Van der Waals epitaxy. And then I, I'm going to see show you how we can grow nanostructures on this 2D platform. Uh, and then I will summarize. So just to start with motivation, so I, I would I would like to start with my motivation to do research in, in three night rides. So I will start with something that you know, uh, which is silicon. So silicon is, is one of the most used electronic materials we have known, okay? So it, 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 it started to find applications after discovery of transistors, and then it has been uh, part of solar cells, electronic sensors, and name it, you, you can find applications of uh, silicon in whatever the electronic circuit you see. So basically, we are using silicon because it is it is it's one of the, it's not because, but we are using silicon because it is abundant, lower in cost, high quality, large area, up to 12 inch wafers are available, very, very mature device processing and reliable works can be done on silicon uh, on a large scale. So that's why we are using silicon and we have no competitors to beat this material uh, in terms of yield production and mass manufacturing. So, but it, this material, it, it, has, it has its intrinsic problems. So the difficulties in these materials are, these materials cannot emit light because it, it is an indirect band gap. So I will come back to the transistor uh, where we are limited with bandwidth and, and more power requirements. So first to deal with light emission. So silicon cannot emit light because it is a indirect band gap material. So here you can see a comparison between direct band. So I, what I'm showing momentum uh, plot of a direct and indirect band gap material. So direct band gap material, you can see the conduction band minimum and valence band maximum are aligned. So you can have a transition or electron transition from uh, from your uh, conduction band maximum or conduction band minimum to a valence band maximum without losing any additional energy. So in case of uh, indirect band gap material such as silicon, you see that uh, the conduction band minimum and valence band maximum are not aligned, it is misaligned. So you to conserve the momentum, you have to first have a phonon assistance to travel from one energy state to another energy state or to from the conduction band minimum to somewhere in between to a metastable state, which is heat. And then you will have a transition from that metastable state to a uh, conduction band minimum or uh, valence band maximum uh, with the light emission. So this transition is highly inefficient. Normally you will have phon phonon generating heat and normally the light emission is, is, is so small that you cannot detect or have a very efficient light emitting diodes. So general solutions to these problems or inherent problems that we have in silicon is to switch the materials. So what, what kind of materials we can switch? So we, we had to switch to direct band gap materials. Uh, one of the direct band gap materials is 3,5 semiconductor material. Uh, we have gallium arsenide, gallium nitride. Is, gallium nitride is also 3,5 material, but from to declassify this uh, gallium nitride material from 3,5s, we have a separate class, which is 3 nitrides which is also a 3-5 compound semiconductor. It has a direct band gap, but 
uh, to but on a larger scale it is a wide band gap material in general so when you're comparing to gallium arsenide the band gap is 1.1 eb but when you uh, when you talk about the band gap of gallium nitride it is around 3.4 eb so i'm just going to talk about that more so here is the band gap you see all three nitrides except boron nitride which i'm going to deal with it a little bit later so here you see gallium nitride aluminum nitride and indium nitride all three nitrides and related materials zinc oxide and silicon carbide are related materials to three nitrides uh, because they all have wide band gap so if you see these uh, indium nitride as as a lower energy uh, when compared to gallium nitride and aluminum nitride so indium nitride can be alloyed with gallium nitride and we can cover all the visible part of the spectrum here uh, to uh, to have light emission. Normally, we have light emission of blue and green from indium gallium nitride materials. So, if you are forming a heterostructure, um, you can have uh, indium gallium nitride as a quantum well and gallium nitride as a barrier, and you can form a light emitting diode structures without any issues. So, that's what we have done. I'm going to deal with it a little later. So if you are going on the other side, if you are going above 3.4 EB, you can easily form aluminum gallium nitride alloys and you can have UV light emitting diodes. So especially with three nitrides, you can cover the entire light emitting spectrum or visible light spectrum. And also you can cover a large part of UV, UV uh, ABC uh, spectrum. Uh, this is not possible with zinc oxide or silicon carbide element because there is no special alloying, alloying freedoms. Uh, so you have large EG span, which is an energy gap span, and also direct band gap. All of them are direct band gaps. So you, can, you have a lot of freedom in these three nitride material system. That's why it finds a huge application in optoelectronics as, as blue and green light emitting diodes, laser diodes, and also they are they are in UV, UV light emitting regime also. Why in microelectronics? So this is the part where I talk about a lot of electronics. Uh, that's what I said before. Um, so silicon, as I said, it is not the best material for, for electronic applications also, but we are using them because they are the cheapest and also they, they can be mass produced without any problems. Uh, here you see, uh, when you see here, gallium nitride has, 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 has also potential properties to be used in microelectronics. It has biocompatibility, chemical and thermal stability. As, as he was showing before, uh, uh, the speaker before showed us, when the temperature increases, we lose all the, uh, all the hysteresis properties in, in gallium arsenide itself. Gallium arsenide has a band gap of around 1.7 eV, but silicon has a band gap uh, around 1.1 uh, eV. So when you are increasing the temperature, you lose all the characteristics of the material, or because of thermal punching, you, you lose all the characteristics of your material. But in case of gallium nitride, because it has wide band gap, you can, you can increase the temperature uh, oper operability of these materials uh, to let's say 800 degrees C without any problems. So you can increase the uh, operation temperature without any problems when you are using gallium nitride. Not only that, if you are talking about a silicon based chips, the latest chip is let's say five or seven nanometer size, uh, size channel length. And the number of operations you can do per second is one trillion operations per second. Uh, so it can clock at few hundreds to few thousand gigahertz frequency. So if you see the equation, what I have mentioned here, FT is equal to BE divided by two pi LG, which LG is the gate length, BE is the electron drift velocity, which I have plotted here. So if you see that for gallium uh, or let's say silicon, it is let's say 1.5 and for gallium nitride, it is close to three. So you can have double the frequency of operations or threshold frequency when compared to silicon without any issues. So you, you will have more freedom in terms of gate length or, uh, or the channel width, maintaining the same speed of your operations. So you can increase the speed of operations or frequency of operations without any problem or without the need for reducing your gate length. 
So that's basics. Uh, so if you increase further, if you want to increase further, but you, you cannot go beyond three nanometer gate length, you have to switch ma material like, uh, like gallium, gallium nitride or indium nitride or indium gallium nitride alloys so that you can have the same gate length. Why we have to have the same gate length of three to five nanometer is that because if you are reducing further, you are going to uh, hit the quantum quantum regime, which is very, very tough to control because you have to talk about qubits and the control switch on and off control is very, very difficult in that regime. If you are, if you are talking about controlling uh, a gate length less than three or two nanometer, you will be you will be in a quantum uh, or particle in a box problem where you cannot control anything or the control is very, very, uh, it's not, uh, it's not foreseen for, for now. Uh, control is very difficult in that regime. So just to compare, uh, I have listed the uh, electronic properties or the needed properties of uh, different uh, semiconductor materials here. So you, you can see the table, we have silicon gallium arsenide, silicon carbide, and gallium nitride. The energy gaps are also given. Uh, the energy gap of silicon is 1.12 EV, gallium arsenide is 1.4 EV, silicon carbide is three, gallium nitride is around 3.5 EV. The thermal conductivity of gallium nitride and silicon is almost matching very well. So you can coat or deposit gallium nitride material on, uh, on silicon and you can have the same uh, same thermal conductivity matching but the problem is there is a large lattice mismatch between silicon and gallium nitride so you cannot directly coat gallium nitride on on silicon instead you have to use different buffer layers to to support gallium nitride on silicon similarly you have uh, electron mobility also very 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 matching with silicon carbide or silicon uh, but not as good as gallium arsenide. But that's not a big issue. We have electron mobility uh, that is matching with uh, with silicon. That's also very good. The whole mobility is lower in gallium nitride because it's a wide band gap material with a lot of defects. So uh, you you can assume that the electron mobility will be lower. Uh, the very important point is is here uh, we have a breakdown field. The breakdown field is ten times larger when you are comparing with uh, with silicon for gallium nitride so this is a very big advantage when you when you are comparing it with silicon so you can push a lot of power without without having a failure so this is meant for high temperature high high power operations this material gallium nitride so you can in in a place of uh, let's say having three silicon and diodes you can use only one gallium nitride because your threshold will be very high let's say 3.5 uh, divided by or 30 percent of 3.5 is around 2.3 ev or let's say 2.3 volt in the place of 0.7 ev or 0.7 volt in case of silicon so you, if you want to use gallium nitride you can reduce the number of diodes also in your uh, in your uh, regulator or any other circuits you are using. So the major advantages of gallium nitride is we have high breakdown field, high current density, high frequency response. So these are uh, some of the properties that that will drive the uh, the electronic applications of gallium nitride in the in the near future. So this table show shows you. Uh, what is the need of the hover and what is the enabling feature we have in a gallium nitride that gives a performance advantage that is listed on your, onto your right. So here I'm showing you high power per unit width is enabled by wide band gap and high field, which is part of gallium nitride. So you, you can have a compact and uh, compact devices and also there will be ease of matching. So high voltage operation is, give, is driven by high breakdown field which is 10 times larger for gallium nitride when you are comparing with uh, uh, silicon. So it eliminates reduced to step down uh, from a higher voltage to lower voltage to, op to, to enable your operation. So all the time we are, we are using a step down transformer or let's say a, a voltage regulator to, to package of voltage regulator to step down from 230 volts to 12 volts. So this 
this step will lose lo will lose a lot of energy because the power conversion uh, conversion with transformer is not always efficient so we we'll lose a lot of uh, energy because of this transfer uh, so we can save a lot of energy when you are using gallium nitride so so you can have high efficiency also because you have high operating voltage uh, because your your operating voltage will increase uh, with with your band gap so you can have a lot of power saving reduced cooling so very important technology is the thermal management of or of heat uh, in your silicon devices as you are seeing your laptops they will be uh, warm uh, not very hot it will be warm around 60 degrees c when it is operating with with a lot of multitasking operations you are doing so this uh, temperature means that it it loses a lot of energy by producing heat so you have to have a cooling circuit uh, to make uh, to make your processor operate at this kind of temperature but when you are switching to gallium nitride because it is uh, thermally uh, lattice or thermally matched with your silicon you can you can put gallium nitride on silicon and make hem devices and you can see that you have better uh, thermal management so because uh, you need a buffer which is very thick you will not be managing very well the thermal properties of this buffer so you had to put them in on silicon carbide so we have a very interesting uh, solution for this problem. So you can use a 2D material in between these uh, silicon and, uh, and the gallium nitride and you can have a very good thermal management also. Uh, the best possible solution for, for managing heat in, in hemp-like devices of gallium nitride would be to use diamond which is the best known thermal conductor uh, in the field. But because it is expensive and they, still the diamond is, is under development, it is not as mature as silicon, we cannot replace all the circuits on, onto diamond. But uh, at some point of time, we have to switch from silicon to diamond for, for some of the special applications we see. Um, so uh, if you manage thermal, uh, thermal problems in, in your gallium-nitrate hems, you can have high-power devices with reduced cooling needs. So, we cannot replace uh, silicon technology with gallium nitride technology, but uh, because you have already a lot of chips running in silicon, and also you have need for a lot of chips that's, that's going to come uh, in the near future with silicon also. So how you, can, how you can leverage your gallium nitride technology is by using, uh, using the light emitting platform, or let's say, all the LEDs platform run with gallium nitride technology. So you can use these foundries to make your devices or to mass produce your devices, which is driving force for low cost and mass, mass manufacturing. So last but not least, I said with high power unit per width, per unit width, you can have compactness. So this is an Apple adaptator we are using right now, and this can be 30, only 30% 30 if you are changing the chips in your in your adaptator from silicon to gallium nitride. This was demonstrated from uh, by UK and also from MIT very recently. I think it was it was last year. They they replaced all the chips of silicon with gallium nitride and they reduced the size to 30% of the size what what we have right now. But a uh, lot of technologies are not adapting to this size variation because it will be a little bit more expensive. That's why still, uh, still the market is uh, only on, or 99% of the market is with silicon technology. But 1% is, is good enough for, for a lot of startups to uh, emerge. So these are uh, many other applications of nitrate semiconductors beyond solid state lighting and transistor applications. So you can see that you have solid state lighting. So you can convert uh, blue LEDs into white LEDs by using a yellow phosphor. So if you are using a white LED, you can see that uh, when it is off, you can see the yellow color on top of these white LEDs. These are yellow phosphors coated on top of blue LEDs to give you a white LED. So blue light, converted or down converted with yellow phosphor 
to have a white light. So the efficiency of your white light is always lower than your efficiency of the blue light uh, because you are down converting your blue, blue uh, light emitting diodes or the efficiency of your blue light emitting diodes into white. So is also, uh, which is normally in your tube lights, you can see that you are you are down you are up converting 280 nanometer light from using a mercury phosphor. So in your tube light you have a mercury coating, uh, which is toxic also. So you can avoid this. But uh, there is a lot of technologies coming with UV LEDs. Uh, there is a company called Sora which is using 385 nanometer light, which is violet, uh, and converting them to white light, which is which is another spectrum of uh, solid state lighting. So apart from solid state lighting, you can use it for UV detectors, blue laser diodes, uh, hydrogen fuel cells is also possible, which is still under under intense study. Uh, in in part of uh, transistors, uh, you can have you can use gallium nitrate for RF power transistors. That's the wireless base stations for 5G applications and more beyond 5G applications. Also, you can use it as power uh, con conversions in in your in your automobile for driving your. Uh, for example, in trains, you need a high power uh, conversion uh, circuits. For that, you can use gallium nitrides. And also, in your EV vehicles or electronic vehicles, you have to use a power conversion module uh, for which gallium nitride is most suitable. You can use it for switching applications also, but still. We cannot replace gallium nitride wherever we can, uh, or we cannot replace silicon wherever we can use silicon. We have to use silicon, but this gallium nitride is more efficient than silicon. More efficient, it can be cost effective, uh, but it, it's going to take a little bit time to replace silicon in 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 some of the niche areas. Um, also for engine electronics, temperature sensors, and also for combustion. Uh, Waters, you can use gallium nitride, which can, so, which is suitable for high temperature applications. So you can have a chip directly on your fuel exhaust and see whether you have uh, more CO2 or NO2 coming out from your fuel exhaust. If it is, you can switch it back to your fuel so that it, it will be more efficient. So these are some of the applications or a short introduction to three nitrides. Let me go to epitaxy, so which is the second topic uh, of uh, in my outline. So epitaxy, what is epitaxy? So epitaxy, we can have homo epitaxy. Epitaxy literally means epi means on, taxi means arrangement. So we are arranging atoms on top of uh, something. So that's that's what epitaxy means. Uh, to be more clear, in 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 technical point of view, we are arranging atoms on top of a single crystalline substrate. That's what epitaxy means. So growing a crystal on top of crystal is what epitaxy is. Um, so we can have two kinds of epitaxy. One is homo epitaxy and the other one is heteroepitaxy. Homo epitaxy means growing the same layer which is similar to uh, your substrate. So you have a substrate of silicon and if you are growing silicon on top of it, that's called homoepitaxy. And heteroepitaxy is something that uh, we call or we grow uh, a layer which is different from the substrate or single crystalline substrate. So if I'm growing gallium nitride on silicon carbide or on silicon, it's called as heteroepitaxy. Even though there is lattice matching, the, 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 the layer and substrate are chemically different, uh, we call it as heteroepitaxy. So generally, gallium nitride is grown heteroepitaxially on sapphire substrates due to the non-availability of bulk gallium nitride substrates. Even though we have few bulk gallium nitride substrates, they are very, very expensive. One centimeter into one centimeter gallium nitride bulk substrates cost like 8,000 euros. So it's very, very expensive. So we end up with a highly defective material. We have a lot of point defects, misfit dislocations, and, and large uh, dislocation densities. Uh, there will be anti-phase boundaries and inversion domain boundaries also uh, in this uh, in this material. Apart from that, these materials are very very efficient light emitters and 
and has a very good quality and it preserves the functionality of these materials. So if we have a reduced thermal conductivity, rapid impur impurity diffusion pathways are created, leading to uh, stochastic failures of these devices. So to avoid these, we have to have high quality layers, which is another field where we can ha have a patterning and improve the, improve the material quality. So I'm going to deal with that a little bit later also. So here I'm showing you an extended view of the energy band diagram. So you have seen uh, in, in my previous slide, you have seen gallium nitride, aluminum nitride, and indium nitride. Here I have added another binary, which is boron nitride. So boron nitride gives you a little bit more freedom in terms of uh, lattice and also for in terms of uh, energy band gap. So you can cover almost the entire uh, visible spectrum with gallium nitride and indium, indium gallium nitride material. That's where these three gentlemen come in. So they are uh, they have worked on this small area, uh, which is highlighted with the blue square, and they got Nobel Prize in 2014 for that. So they developed gallium nitride technology and and light emission. They uh, Suji Nakamura uh, went further and demonstrated blue light emitting diodes using these gallium nitride that. Isamu Akasaki and Hiroshi Amono developed. So that's why the, the Nobel Prize was shared by these three gentlemen, uh, researchers and scientists. So after that, we, we said, okay, there is a lot of work done in this area. Let's do a lot of work, or let's say, let's explore this boron nitride and aluminum nitride area for UV LEDs and also for other applications. So we, we basically work on this area also where they got Nobel Prize and also we explore other areas like boron nitride and aluminum nitride, which are very interesting for UV light emission and also for neutron detection detector applications. So this is what we so we have two MOCVD systems which can go up to let's say 1560 degrees C. We can use uh, nitrogen or hydrogen ambience. We can use all sorts of precursors that is needed to grow uh, gallium nitride, indium nitride, aluminum nitride, boron nitride, and alloys of these with doping control. So we can have it n-type doping or p-type doping, depending on what, what heterostructures we are growing. So we have two uh, MOCVD systems. The one on the top is a T-shaped MOCVD system. This is a homemade, custom-built MOCVD system. And one on the bottom is um, is a is a commercially available close couple shower head MOCVD system. The cost of this system is around, let's say, uh, 1.5 million euros, and it can hold three into two two uh, two inch sapphire wafers or sapphire or silicon wafers, and the one on the top can hold one two inch wafer. So you you can see that when we are heating up around 1,000 degrees, it glows with orange bloom. That's how we how we grow this material at 1,000 degrees. So this is the breakup of, of our MOCVD system. Uh, so we can we can pass uh, hydrogen and nitrogen on trimethyl gallium and ammonia uh, into the reactor. We we have a very precise and high purity mixture that's going into the into the into the reactor. Here you you can see that trimethyl gallium GaCH3 times three will give will come will combine with ammonia at particular. Uh, pressure and temperature conditions to give gallium nitride and methane. So after that, the exhaust gas will be filtered out through a throttle valve to vacuum pump in, and scrubbed out into the atmosphere. So almost all the production and research uh, reactors, they have inbuilt so safety and also crystal quality and uniformity monitor uh, inbuilt with these reactors. So to give you a good analogy to what we are doing in the reactor, uh, we have rain and snow. So at particular condition, we have snow. That's what is happening inside the reactor also. So in a particular condition, the vapor molecules or H2O molecules will directly convert into snow. That's what we are doing here exactly. So at particular condition, we are converting gallium uh, and nitrogen into gallium nitride solid from vapor phase. That's why we call it as MOCVD, which is metal organic chemical vapor deposition. 
So this is one of the blue LED structures I have grown uh, previously uh, in, in, in these labs. So we, we start from sapphire, we, we grow a 30 nanometer low temperature gallium nitride, and then we grow two or three micron thick gallium nitride doped with silicon at high temperature. And then we, we grow gallium nitride barrier, indium gallium nitride, which is the quantum well, which was the heterostructure with, uh, with a, with a well-like uh, energy band diagram when compared to gallium nitride. So it, it confines your electron, which is more efficient than having a PIN structure. Uh, so these are quantum well configuration. So after that, we have a barrier here because we are confining this indium gallium nitride, which has a lower band gap than gallium nitride, you, you see that there is total infer, internal reflection within indium gallium nitride, this three nanometer. So you can have lasing also in, in the same structure. So this barrier and active region, barrier and well region is repeated three, three to five times to have a multiple quantum wells. So this one stack, this one stack is repeated five times to have a multiple quantum well. After that, we have p-type gallium nitride on top of it to have a hole injection. So when you are putting a probe on top of it, you will see that from the holes from gallium nitride doped with magnesium, which is p-type, will enter indium gallium nitride valence band, and the electrons from gallium nitride doped with silicon will enter into uh, indium gallium nitride uh, on the onto the conduction band and they will recombine into in in your well so you are you are pushing a lot of electrons from your endo material and holes uh, to the well uh, from your p dope material so it will recombine in in the quantum well and give you light so this is the pl emission room temperature pl emission of indium gallium nitride this is a single quantum well emission you still have an emission but it is not as efficient as multiple quantum well emission because you are seeing this after the p-type gallium nitride it is not very efficient but with electroluminescence you can see it very well so multiple quantum wells obviously has better emission efficiency than your single quantum well this is how we test uh, our as grown wafers so this uh, this is a p-type probe on top so light emission is from p-type probe and this is your n-type probe we scratch it we scratch a little bit to to go into the n-type region so that we can have an emission uh, of blue light from these gallium nitride wafers or indium gallium nitride based M MQW wafers. So you can you can see that the entire wafer glows because you you have not processed a, uh, only a small region because you are just testing the entire wafer. But if you are pushing a lot, lot of current into it, you can see that the entire wafer glows already. So this is one of the photographs of, of a processed LED. So you can see that there is a huge intensity of light, blue light coming from one of the processed LEDs where we have probes. We are electrically injecting current into this uh, area and we are, we are activating only one device, uh, which is a small square in that area. This, fabricated uh, blue LED structures after device fabrication. So that's uh, how we do how we do a blue LED epitaxially on sapphire substrates and then fabricate. So what you see commercially on blue LED structures is same effort diced into very small devices and then coated on top of it or placed on top of it with wires and stuff like that. So where you can drive a little bit of current to have a, uh, have a blue emission. So that's what I'm showing in a wafer scale on a two inch platform. So you can have in a commercial reactor, you can go up to six inch and, or eight inch to have, uh, have higher yield uh, per, per, per wafer. So here I'm showing you in a research scale on a two inch wafer. So after epitaxy, I said I will, I'm going to deal with nano epitaxy, uh, which is a, not a new science, but it is a little bit old, but we have better understanding with a with lot of materials in nano epitaxy. So here I have shown you conventional epitaxy, so which is a layer and substrate, even though if, if it is different, it's not a problem. Uh, but 
when you are doing heteroepitaxy, the problem I said is you will be generating a lot of defects because there is a lattice and thermal mismatch. You will you will see that after certain thickness, which is critical thickness, you will generate a lot of a uh, lot of defect, defects in these uh, in these layers. But when you are going to nano heteroepitaxy, you will see that that step with epilayer thickness, you see that strain energy is increasing linearly uh, in conventional epitaxy. You are confining these to very small region, let's say from 10 to 100 nanometer, you see that the strain energy will follow the black line. So after certain thickness, the strain energy will be constant. So you can have a high quality material in this regime, in this nano regime, uh, without any problem because your strain energy is constant, you can increase the thickness without generating any defects, or you can have a complete strain relaxation without having any problem. How we can do that? There is two kinds of technology. One is uh, self-assembly, where you don't do any patterning, and the other one is uh, restricting the area of growth. So here I have, in a planar region, we put a silicon dioxide mask where, uh, where the gallium nitride or gallium arsenide doesn't grow because of a difference in chemical potential or surface energy. So the, the precursor ingredients just diffuse uh, to the corner where you have sag region or opening. So you have silicon dioxide mask and you have opening and all the gallium nitride or gallium arsenide will grow only in this area or where there is opening because you cannot grow on silicon dioxide because there is uh, energy difference or chemical potential difference. So this is what we can do. So this is the, the gray area, the dark gray area is a silicon dioxide mask and the light, light gray crystals you are seeing are less than 80 nanometer of, of opening where we can grow high quality indium gallium nitride on gallium nitride templates. So to, just to compare, I have zoomed in in a small area. I'm showing you a highly oriented indium gallium nitride crystals without any defects. You cannot visibly see any defects. But when you are comparing to the planar region, which is from the edge of this, of this sample, you can see that there is a lot of defects. Here you, you can see there is a good quality indium gallium nitride, but these are trench defects and v pits appear all over the surface of this indium gallium nitride because of spinodal decomposition. And also you cannot grow beyond the critical thickness, which is very, very low for indium gallium nitride. For indium gallium nitride, the critical thickness is two to three nanometer. That's why in our wells, we, we always keep two to three nanometer thickness uh, for these kind of materials. But using this nano heteroepitaxy technology, we can go up to 200 nanometers without any problem. 200 nanometers of these materials are needed for solar cell technology. So uh, the previous speaker was explaining qua qua uh, shock lake quasar limit, which is uh, the efficiency cannot increase beyond 35% of your, approximately 32% of your, of your silicon, uh, in your silicon cells. But when you are using indium gallium nitride, you can capture uh, other frequencies and in a multi-junction configuration, you can go up to 80% solar cell efficiency. So if you are using indium gallium nitride, uh, different wavelengths can be captured in, in, your, in, your, in the same module, and you can, use, you can have 80% efficiency in your solar cells. So that's, that's a very intense research that's ongoing on these indium gallium nitride materials. So gallium nitride templates, we can have it because nano heteroepitaxy is ind independent of your substrate, you can have the same patterns on different templates. For example, I, I am comparing here with three, three materials, aluminum nitride and also with zinc oxide and also on gallium nitride template, you can have same quality indium gallium nitride on three different templates without any problem. Even though these are very closely lattice matched, it's not, it's, it will give a big quality difference when you are comparing, when you are doing it epitaxially on, on, on other templates. But here, when you are applying nano heteroepitaxy, you will see that the quality doesn't change when you are changing your substrate. So not only that, we can cover this uh, material with P-type 
gallium nitride as I have shown here this is the uh, device structure we start from sapphire gallium nitride template here we have nano uh, pyramids uh, or the nano structures I have shown we have coated p-type on top of it and put a metal contact uh, to have uh, to study how good is these solar cells when you are seeing it is the dark current characteristics you can have light emission from it and these your when you are having a um, when you this is your photocurrent characteristics your jsc is 12.7 milliampere per centimeter square voc is 2 volt and your fill factor is around 14 percent it's very low but uh, for for uh, for let's say a device size of let's say a few microns it's 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 a very good value uh, so we are trying to further improve improve the characteristics we have here and achieve better better efficiency so uh, this is uh, when we are illuminating it with equivalent of three suns. Um, so it's a, it's a very good results or very encouraging results, if I say. So it's on a pattern of 60 micron into 50, 60 micron. It's not on a large area to compare it with standard silicon solar cell. But uh, it will be done uh, very, very soon. Uh, you, you will see some solar cells based on these indium gallium nitride nanopyramids pretty soon. So, next thing is Van der Waals epitaxy. Why we need Van der Waals epitaxy, especially for flexible electronics, we don't need uh, these rigid substrates. Rigid substrates, what I mean by rigid substrate is that they are single crystalline substrate, they are brittle. So, I want to remove these substrates from my, from, from my micron thick active layers. So, my, my layers are micron thick, uh, active layers are micron thick but I have few hundred microns thick substrates. So I, because of presence of these few hundred micron thick substrate, I cannot use it for flexible electronics. I want to remove these. And I can use a lot of technology. I can etch this material substrate off, or I can use a laser lift off technology for that. Laser lift off technology, again, gives us a lot of uh, flaws in my material because I am passing a high energy laser through my material. So it will give me a lot of defects and interface quality is also not good so that I cannot make any vertical devices. But in, in the case of Andrew Wall's epitaxy, it has been demonstrated something like this by uh, NTT group in Japan, uh, where we have uh, used a three nanometer thick boron nitride on top of sapphire substrate and then grow gallium nitride device structures on top of it. So this three nanometer boron nitride acts as a sacrificial layer because these are these are layers held by just van der Waals force we can peel it off without have without having any external devices so you just put a tape and peel it off you will have your active devices on your tape and leaving the substrate apart so this is very very interesting for for uh, lift off technology so for that, we used boron nitride. Not only for that, we can use Van der Waals epitaxy for graphene electronics, Van der Waals heterostructures, DPV optoelectronics, and solid state neutron, uh, neutron detectors technology. So we are actively pursuing all these area in terms of boron nitride and boron gallium nitride, aluminum nitride uh, alloys technology. So here I'm sharing you the latest results on uh, Van der Waals epitaxy. So here you can see uh, two-inch uh, boron nitride on sapphire substrate. Here you can see boron nitride again on four-inch substrates. So nobody has demonstrated uh, the wrinkle patterns in boron nitride. So we have optimized our conditions in such a way that we have best quality boron nitride in uh, in in sapphire substrate. So this was done in 2016. Even the Nobel Prize winner I showed in the previous slide, Hiroshi Amano, he demonstrated uh, these kind of patterns in, in, uh, on sapphire substrate with boron nitride in 2018. So we have sapphire substrate, and this is a cross-sectional image showing layer by layer uh, that confirming that these nitride is 2D layered. This is the atomic resolution or high resolution image of, of my 2D layers showing that we have A, B, A, B stacking hexagonal boron nitride. You can see each atomic layers separated by 
just held by band walls force. And we have precise measurements of the stacking, se uh, stacking sequence and also the lattice distance with this, uh, with this image. So all these characterizations can be uh, boron nitride and also it is in hexagonal phase and also it is 2D material or it is 2D layer. Using this material, what we have done is we have gone further and demonstrated in, in wafer scale hexagonal boron nitride as a sacrificial layer. Uh, we use this uh, wafer scale hexagonal boron nitride to, to make this device, which is a quantum well device, which can emit blue light. After that, we made a, a wafer scale transfer. So whatever we I showed here uh, is a demonstration by uh, NTT group. It was on a very, very small scale. They have even reported that the scalability and also the quality of hexagonal boron nitride is very, very low during that time. Uh, and the commercial applications of this technology will rely on the quality and commercial commercialization of this technology will rely on the quality and scalability of this boron nitride. And also we have, uh, we have uh, the lift of, of active device layer onto a flexible tape. And we have shown that we can still have blue light emission, which is the optical functionality of this device structure. We can have plastic like behavior, which is extremely flexible. Uh, which is which is the feature that we say for flexible electronics. This article was uh, was uh, as featured in Semiconductor Today. Uh, the link is here, or the photograph of this is shown here. So this this demonstration has re reignited the research on three nitride uh, again, where you can use. Um, uh, a wafer scale 2D material and you can grow your device structures on them and you can transfer mechanically your device structures without any problem. We see that there is cracks, but uh, your active device area, let's say 50 micron into 50 micron is, is preserved. Even though you have cracks, that will not be a problem. Now in 2016, now after, after many optimization, we can have crack-free liftoff let's say uh, up to centimeter into centimeter square devices without any problem. The technology is different. Here we are not using any, uh, any wax host to lift off, but when you are using a wax host, you are not moving these gallium nitride uh, wafers, uh, so you are strongly held and you can avoid all these cracks because you are just going to apply shear force. When you are applying shear force, you, you, you tend to move all these gallium nitride uh, active regions and you generate a lot of cracks. In this case, when you are using a wax host, you are you are not moving, hence you can avoid a lot of cracks. So this is my last last topic, which is a nano nanostructures on two D platform. So you, here I am showing you. Previously, I have shown you uh, how you can pattern the substrates and you can have nanostructures. Here I am showing you the self assembly. On, on, on a 2D material. So 2D, growing nanostructures on 2D material is very, very interesting because you can transfer this 2D material without any issues or you can transfer using this 2D material the nanostructures on this 2D material to any arbitrary platform without any issues. Um, that's why it is very, very interesting. So here what I'm showing is just gallium nitride nanorods. Uh, the, the size and density of these nanorods can be controlled by just uh, using a seeding time or seeding layer growth time. So here I have uh, represented it. Not only gallium nitride, we can do the entire LED structure as shown here on these on these uh, gallium nitride nanorods, and we can have uh, the same quality preserved without any problems. So here you can see blue light coming from these some of these nanorods already. Not only that, we, we can do the same thing on silicon platform and also on quartz platform without any issue. So we take quartz, we put, uh, let's say, boron nitride layer on top of it and then put uh, aluminum nitride seeding layer and we start gallium nitride growth as normal where we have 2D and we get nanorods here also without any issues. And also very important thing is that we can lift it off without any problem. So this is the uh, 
graphical representation of what we have achieved. So we can have aluminum nitride or let's say gallium nitride on top of a uh, sapphire substrate. We coat it with boron nitride and then we go gallium nitride nanostructures and then we can peel it off just by using tape and we can transfer it to any arbitrary platforms. This was done last year. So with this, I think I will finish. So to, to summarize, what we have seen is we have seen epitaxy, homoepitaxy, heteroepitaxy, and then I have shown you how we are growing gallium nitride based multi quantum well LED structures on them and how we are testing them to have light emission, blue light emission. After that, I have I have dealt with nano heteroepitaxy. I have shown you patterning of sapphire substrates and how we are growing indium gallium nitride, defect free indium gallium nitride on top of these patterned uh, gallium nitride templates. After that, I have moved on to Van der Waals epitaxy. I have showed you a very interesting lift off uh, applications of these Van der Waals epitaxy. Not only that, we can use boron nitride for other applications also. So I have reviewed that also. And then I have shown you a few examples of nanostructures or self assembly of gallium nitride nanostructures and LED structures on top of this boron nitride, which is very interesting for future applications. So with this, I, I, I think I will finish it off. I will thank you and I thank the organizers for, for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you for your uh, informative session. Uh, the presentation is highly interesting and uh, highly application oriented session. The silicon market and gallium nitrate markets and adapters, blue LEDs and basics of epitaxial growth. Your talk is excellent and thank you once again. If you have any queries, participants, you can ask. Yeah, I'm open to questions. Uh, one person asked before, it's how about the stability of interlayers? Uh, the stability of interlayers, so you are you are talking about the strain management in, in these layers, uh, yes. which is very, very delicate. So uh, it, it is now reproducible when we first started to do it. It was like we have a simultaneous or spontaneous peeling off of these layers. So we have we have managed strain in these layers very well right now, and we, ca we can have uh, no peel off or uh, or there is no peel off right now in these structures. We can have reproducibility or excellent reproducibility in these structures. It's very stable right now. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, audience, participants? Thank you. Uh, if there is no questions, uh, we will wind up the session. So the feedback form link is, has been posted in the chat box. So you can just uh, fill the form and then it's automatically you can receive your e-certificate.